IPCC has just released its most recent report on climate change, and the message is grim. A code red for humanity has been declared. The science, Matt, is irrefutable, and yet the coalition still seems stuck on climate policy. The Prime Minister is even pushing for a fossil fuel gas-led recovery. I may be one of the infamous millennials, but at least I'm having a go. I've reduced my meat consumption, I buy renewable power, and I've even signed up to my local fire brigade. So I'll hold the hose, mate, but what's the government going to do? All right, so the IPCC report out this week says human influence has warmed the climate at a rate that's unprecedented, at least in the last 2,000 years, and it says each of the last four decades has been successively warmer than any decade that preceded it since 1880, 1850. Matt Canavan, this is a report from uh, 234 scientists, and it's based on more than 14,000 peer-reviewed scientific papers, and yet you've cast some doubt on the findings. What do you know that they don't? Well, um, <clears throat> David, I think it's best just to quote some of their own words. So one of the IPCC authors was quoted a few months ago saying that he hoped this report would scare people uh, and that it would scare people enough so that it would help change their vote. Uh, now, that doesn't sound like science to me and it's, I think, a great shame. It's very sad that the IPCC, who once did very, very good work, uh, and I do agree with their overall findings on climate change, but now it is, it has descended into something that's much more like, uh, like spin uh, than well, science. Probably, we, we saw that over the past week. People, though, when they... It probably does scare people, some of these projections would, and findings. Well, I mean, why would, why would a scientist want to change people's vote? I mean, uh, this, this is... The, the, you saw the spin over the past week as they drip-fed the, the fear porn about this rather than just release the science. Hang on. Indeed, the questioner himself... Are you saying, it's, you're saying it's fear porn or are you saying you agree with the findings, which I, I think you just said? I said the overall findings. So I'll explain why that's the case. There's a guy called Dodger, Dr Roger Pilkey Jr. Uh, he's a climatologist at the University of Colorado. He's done some really interesting analysis about how, in the IPCC report, they spent half the time, half of their references to different scenarios were to, was to the most extreme scenario, the so-called... RCP or SSP 8.5. And, and that is, at least the IPCC does recognise in their report that that scenario, this time they recognise, is extremely unlikely. But they this spend more the... than half the time focusing oh, on the well, most okay. unlikely uh, outcome. That's the, that's and the, that okay. outcome, that's can I just the finish very, here, David? This is a really high... important point. Just quickly, yes. The, the really important point here is what, what happens here is the IPCC has assumed in some of these scenarios that coal demand will be double what the International Energy Agency In one produces. scenario. This is in so the... Okay. One, of, one of the experts... You're talking about no, the no, very no, no, high few, emissions scenario. There are five <clears throat> yeah, in scenarios. In all right. of them, in all in, of them, in, in all of them, it's projecting that the, 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 the warming will still hit one and a half degrees. In all of them. Uh, in, in, the, in those three ones that do, they all, all of those ones have coal demand being much, much higher than the International Energy Agency predicts. So some experts are wrong. And, and I, 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 I'm a big supporter of coal. But do you agree but with I, this? Even do I you agree with the this? The IPCC projections are loopy. They're this, just loopy. They're just out of control. But do you agree with the, 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 the scenario, all five scenarios pointing to one and a half degrees warming? And then coming back to Julian's question, what's the government going to do about it? <clears throat> Yeah, so, look, the, the government is, is, is taking action. In, in my view, that action is quite futile now because China's not doing anything. And, and this is the reason why we shouldn't sign up to more reductions because it would just be a free kick to China right now. Uh, China's already stolen thousands of jobs, Australian jobs, through their inability to be trusted under the trade agreements we've signed with them, including their ascension to the World Trade Organisation. And so now the proposal is, let's sign another agreement with China, but shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, which shouldn't will we mean be... we'll handicap our own industry. Right, to take that, your point there, shouldn't we be putting international pressure on China to do more than the commitments they have already made, well, rather than luck. giving them an excuse, <laughs> rather than giving them an excuse not to? Well, good luck with that. I mean, good luck. Uh, I mean, the Chinese Communist Party haven't haven't uh, haven't cooperated with health inspectors to find the origin. Why are they, they going to do anything they if haven't... a country like Australia's not? Well, why is China going to why is China going to be trusted now when they weren't in the past? I mean, this is why the prime minister is right to say what we should be doing is developing the technologies right. that mean that cleaner energy is more efficient, and then and then China and other countries will adopt them, of course. But this idea, this wishful thinking that we'll cut all our emissions and somehow China will join us, that's that's madness. Alan, and it will only help 
help in power the Chinese Communist Party, Al which, uh, which <laughs> has got a lot to answer for over the past 18 months. Alan Calder, we just throw up our hands if, and say China's not going to do anything, so why should we? Well, China is committed to net zero emissions by 2060, so 10 years later than the rest of the world. Um, and uh, for yep, them... Yep, I believe that. No, but that's what their commitment is. I mean, if you, you know... Oh, great. That, that... <laughs> Well, that's what they've said. I what mean, what do you want them is, to do, Matt Canavan? What, what, what are they what, supposed is to do? Is there anything they could do that you I would... I mean, the, th the thing is that for China to achieve net zero by 2060 is enormously difficult. I mean, the, the, the transformation that has to take place for China's economy is phenomenal. I mean, it's far greater than anything anywhere else, that anyone else has to do. So, uh, I mean, you're right also. That, so, if, so China's got a commitment that's 10 years after the rest of us. Do we all go, oh, well, we just give up? I mean, that's crazy. I mean, and then the fact is that the, the burden has to be on the advanced nations, which have all benefited from fossil fuels for the last 150 years. So, you know, the, uh, America, Europe, UK, Australia have all had a tremendous benefit from fossil fuels. We are the ones who are going to have to pay for it. Catherine King, let me ask you, the, the IPCC report this week really emphasises that action is needed in the next decade. Labor's committed to net zero by 2050. But is Australia's target, 2030 target, of lowering emissions by 26 to 28%, is that adequate? Well, I guess the first thing I'd say, particularly in response to Matt, I mean, you know, it's pretty clear and he got a pretty good run there, but, you know, Matt's part of the problem and it's devastating to watch over the course of the last 20 years since I've been a member of the House of Representatives, um, we have been unable to elect a parliament that can build consensus and move forward on this. The brief period of time under the Labor government when we did see emissions going down, when we did have uh, some action on climate change, obviously that ended pretty quickly. Uh, once the Abbott government was elected. And it's incredibly frustrating um, to people uh, to see that we've just not been able to get there or elect a parliament that can actually uh, agree about what we need to do and then build that consensus. And unfortunately, I think Matt is part of the problem and quite deliberately so. But, yeah, um, but just coming so back I to think, the question... You know, obviously Labor has Sure, it, sure, it's incredibly frustrating we have democracy. It's incredibly frustrating we have democracy. That's the problem. All right, let's just get an the, answer the, the to the question. It's incredibly elect. frustrating <laughs> that it keeps electing people like you, Matt, I the think, question, is the, yeah, the so frustration the that the we problem. see. Okay. I'm not sure the how question was about the Senate, the Senate whether, is from the National Party's whether, point of view, but anyway. Whether Australia's 2030 target is adequate. Yeah, well, it's clear in terms of Labor's position, it's clear that we do believe pretty strongly, you know, we've, we've said that we have the net zero target by 2050. Uh, you can't start in 2049 to actually do anything about it. You're going to have to have a roadmap to get there. Uh, it's clear the government's going to have to do so as well. It's, you know, whilst it hasn't committed to a target, it's saying, you know, we do want to get emissions down and we're going to have to do something internationally. Uh, Matt's and, and his ilk are the people who are holding us back. The well, other thing to bear in mind, David, is that the report is saying that um, uh, net zero by 2050 is not enough. Yeah, I mean, that's, it is, what, what we have to do in addition to that is to take millions of tonnes of CO2 out of the atmosphere. And we haven't really even got the, the technology for that yet. So the, the, cost, the cost of getting to net zero by 2050 is enormous to begin with. Mm. And then having to take a whole lot of CO2 out of the atmosphere... Uh, by um, within a few decades is going to be enormously expensive. Angela, the Prime Minister talks about technology as the yep. answer here, particularly to drive emissions reduction in developing countries like China, India, Indonesia and so on. Is that a fair enough approach and is Australia doing enough to drive the technology that's going to be required? Look, technology is certainly going to be part of the answer, but I think what Australia has done and the path that we have taken <clears> isn't the least cost, you know, way for Australia to reduce emissions. We've actually taken a higher cost, less effective way. Um, it's reduced economic growth and it will reduce the, the prospects for that innovation and for that technology growth. I'm optimistic. You know, we will have to commit to zero emissions by 2050 um, because the international community is going to make Australia do that. Uh, but, you know, the way that we are doing this at the moment, you know, it isn't setting our country up for success. It isn't setting up our kids for success. It's making this a lot more expensive path than we need to. Well, Paul, this brings in where business is at. What's at stake mm. for Australia when it comes to not only trade penalties we might face, but investment we might lose if we don't go down this path? Well, this is interesting. A recent survey done in Australia said that um, Australians are actually three times more concerned about 
dealing with climate change rather than the pandemic. And that's really concerning. So that makes retailers very concerned. Uh, and we've got, there's a long way to go. And it's very disturbing to hear Matt's comments. And um, I think it's there's a leadership void on this particular issue. And, you know, we need to see business and industry get more involved. And what we do know is that retailers are prepared. We've got um, our supermarkets, our Aussie supermarkets in this country are leading the way when it comes to showing other retailers about sustainability. They appear in the top 20 most sustainable retailers in the world. So what I'd like to see is better consultation with business rather than just the fossil fuel industry. At the end of the day, uh, just to wrap up this discussion, uh, Senator Canavan, you're worried about the cost to Australia. What this report this week tells us once again is the cost of inaction. And in Australia in particular, it says fires are projected to get worse and more frequent. Fire seasons will last longer. Across no, southern Australia, not, drought... That's not, that's not this, right. is, this is from the report. And across southern that's Australia... That's what the report says. It does. This, I'm quoting from the report. So the report says the, the, the report says the report says that fire weather days will increase. There's actually, um, and it also uh, says the, the across studies... southern Australia, drought has already increased, and projections yep. suggest that will worsen. I'm quoting from the report. Yep, yep. So, the, so the, the climate studies. The, the, I questioned the CSIRO about this in the Senate only a couple of months ago. That that there are, there have been no studies to date uh, linking increased bushfire risk to climate change because climate change changes a range of things around vegetation growth. And what tell that to our firefighters, well mate. Weather. Tell, us, so, tell that to so, our firefighters, well, really. OK, well, I'm, I'm now I'm quoting the scientists. So really? it's either we believe well, the science or don't. Tell we it don't. to the so, Greeks. So, <laughs> I, I mean... The, yeah, well, the, that's a good the, point. Going back... So, OK, but just to be clear here, to, are you, are you question, suggesting no. there's no link between climate change and bushfires in Australia, Senator? I, I'm saying that, that there's no studies that link that at that stage, at least according to the CSIRO. That's not according to me. That's according to the CSIRO. There's a direct line in the, in the latest report they did on climate change, which says exactly that's from page 52 from memory. I, I, I mean, they... they um, well, the CSIRO the, reports... The, the issue it's, here it's about state the of the cost. climate report last year was very clear about the warming that has happened in Australia and the impact it's having. Yeah, no, I accept that. I accept that. The, the, re the, the issue here about the cost is we haven't done any detail. And it does say, it. sorry, it does say did. that that, that CSIRO report did. does say that, it co that, that climate change is causing uh, an increase uh, in the occurrence of extreme fire weather. That's from the CSIRO. That's, I agree with that. I agree with that. So I, you're cherry-picking you're cherry picking something. Well. That's the CSIRO. Oh, no, it's, it's very important to be very important to be precise, David. You, you, you didn't say that in your first question, but, but you're right about that. And, 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 uh, and, and in terms of the cost, New Zealand did a study which showed that, in, if, that they would have a, a 2 to 4% reduction in their in employment if they went to net zero. And, the, and in equivalent terms, that would be around 400,000 jobs here in Australia. So what are we going to do about that? That is a massive, massive impact. Okay, but and you're not talking about the job. You're not talking about the job benefits. So let's adopt this. Nor are you talking about the yeah. job losses from climate change. No, that did, is, look, is, that's a computable. Well, well, we, okay. that, that does take into account the benefits because it's a computable general equilibrium model. But we haven't done that here. We haven't done any of those things. Now, after that okay. modelling, New Zealand exempted their agricultural industry from more than half of their emissions. All right, we need <laughs> so we need to move that on. They took into account those costs. Okay.